Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here today. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, intersectionality and disability is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, and so just to top it down to uh, a small slide of my proportion of 15 minutes, I'm going to try to stay on track <laughs> um, because we have many different perspectives here that I think are so integral for this conversation. I have you. Let me turn this thing off. As a brief visual description right, so. for myself, um, I am an African-American woman with uh, medium short brown hair. I am wearing a yellow sweater with a silver necklace and some small silver earrings in my, my background. Uh, it looks like um, a scenic view of the sky. <laughs> that is a campus picture that we use on Zoom. So I was like, oh, this is befitting. Um, so yes, I have a few slide presentations that uh, I just want to be sharing as I think, as we think about um, intersectionality and how it applies to disability and how that will really settle in the framework of how centers of independent living um, can really look at intersectionality and apply it to their own outreach and recruitment strategies and engagements with different types of communities within the disability community. And then of course, like Leah said, if you all have any questions as I'm talking or any thoughts, please feel free to put them in the chat as well. All right, great. Um, so like I said, I love talking about this conversation, this topic, um, and I do it uh, very frequently. Um, it is something that I am actively studying as a PhD student, looking at how intersectionality, the framework, um, really applies to disability community and engagement. Um, I have something that I like to say that people are intersectional, therefore our approaches, our policies, and our program should be centered around intersectionality. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and so many people, I know intersectionality is kind of like a buzz term these, these days, right? Uh, intersectionality, equity, diversity, we are hearing these terms all the time. Um, and so just for a little background history, um, intersectionality was actually coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who I'm going to mention further in the slides in a couple of minutes. Um, but it was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, and it was um, made from her legal scholarship framework to basically describe an experience um, in which people who can come from multiple axes, how they experience um, all different forms of oppression. And so as I'm studying about intersectionality, I came across this really um, captivating quote, which I think summarizes intersectionality in a really beautiful way. It says, but to reduce intersectionality to a mere attention to the difference is to forgo its power as a theoretical and practical orientation. Any liberation movement that focuses only on what all members of the group have in common will best serve the members of the groups who are the least oppressed. And so as we're talking about intersectionality in its framework, I always like to say that we should uh, center intersectionality and not just looking at those who are most affected by intersectionality or identities that can overlap within the intersectional framework, but also those who are more likely to be more marginalized. And when we're looking at disability community um, at large, we often hear in disability spaces that disability is not a monolith. What does that mean? That means that we know that disability does not look the same, it does not present the same or manifest the same um, across all disabled people. Just like disability is a spectrum, um, so does disability and their lived experience is connected to disability uh, span across the entire spectrum of community, of culture, of education level, socioeconomic status, gender, and even political um, frameworks. And so you can go to the next slide. 
So the intersectionality 101. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw says that intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, but it is a prism to understanding how problems work. When we're looking and thinking about how intersectionality should be applied, especially when we're doing engagement in disability-centered uh, organizations or social justice movement, we have to look at those within the community who are often what I like to call multiply marginalized. So this can often include either BIPOC populations, Black, Indigenous, people of color populations who are also overlapping with um, uh, uh, disability identities or it can represent uh, women or those who are of gender minorities who are overlapping within the disability community and how those overlapping of identities and lived experience can often create pockets of further oppression, exclusion, um, stigma, et cetera. And you can go to the next slide. Um, I did have a little video, but we can skip that video. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide. And so I think intersectionality, especially when we're looking at how it is impacting not only the disability community, but in our healthcare landscape as a whole, we know this past year in 2023 that the National Institute of Health, also known as the NIH, finally designated people with disabilities um, as a disparate population experience health disparities. Can you go back one more slide? I think it's jumped ahead a little bit. We all know how these PowerPoint slides can be bouncy. Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> um, is this where you were? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and this is a really important thing to note because not only has this declaration from NIH really opened up the state for the call for more disability specific research, but we have to keep in mind, especially those of you who are in the space who may be healthcare practitioners or work um, adjacent to health to our healthcare system and government, we have to look at how this research is going to not impact the dis disability community as a whole, but what some of these health inequities and disparities <clears throat> are like as you go more into the margin of culture, of racial and ethnic diversity. Um, a perfect example that we have seen of this is from the previous COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we know that we are still very much in um, very much post-COVID era in which our country is recuperating. But one of the prime things that we saw during COVID was not only that we saw this overlapping of uh, COVID was uh, more severely impacting communities of color, but when we looked at the impact of communities of color, that a lot of these people, um, a lot of these communities uh, were not only experiencing comorbidities, but these comorbidities were also exacerbated because of their disability status, which is why some of the results of COVID mm -hmm. were so extreme as compared to other um, racial and ethnic groups. And so I put it this I put this graph here to kind of really give um, a plain visualization of how we see the disparity of how ethnicity and race and how those overlapping or those intersectional identities um, really contribute to health outcomes and how as we're looking to mitigating some of these poor health outcomes, especially in communities of color, that we're going to see a lot of that overlapping, not only communities of color, but um, disabled communities of color, which is really, really important. We see a few statistics here on this slide. You know, an American Indian Alaska Native communities, three in 10 identifying having a disability, and the Black communities is one in four, and white is one in five. And we see that margin of um, that margin of prevalence gets smaller and smaller. And so this is something that we have to keep in mind, um, especially when we're, we have centers like for independent living, who are going into the communities, who are providing uh, direct resources and supports for people with disabilities. And also this will allow us to help us recognize some of the challenges and barriers in getting people supports or direct support or education and awareness um, due to the level of disparity that that particular individual, the family or the community mm -hmm. is experiencing. You can go to the next slide. Can I interrupt for just one second? If you are unmuted, could you please uh, mute your mics? Thank you. Thank you for that. And like I said, here's some more overall general statistics of 
you know, COVID, like I said, again, is a perfect example how the impact of the pandemic really had on BIPOC communities and where we really not only saw a, a marginalization, but where we also saw um, a lot of those intersecting identities and experiences really coming to the surface. And so I like how this kind of overlaps into what we see now, um, how it kind of helped move the disability justice movement forward because we saw that disability justice or outside of the traditional disability rights movement, disability justice was an extension of the general disability rights movement because it started to look at how justice looks like for communities, like I said, who are either facing oppression or who have been traditionally left out of disability rights movements. And that often include not only just BIPOC communities, but it also included um, women, uh, those of gender minorities, it included um, queer communities, um, it included communities that were lower socioeconomic status. And so we see that justice has really been, I would say a grounding framework to ensure that everyone has equity and equal access to the different health needs, supports and resources, and they're able to get it in a way that they are able to receive it. I once heard, um, a president at Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, which is also my alumni institution, um, she once said, and this has always stuck with me, that equity is giving people what they need in the way that they need it. And so when we're thinking about the centers of independent living and the type of services and things that you're giving, we can't apply it in a one Band-Aid fits all situation. In applying an intersectional framework, we're able to delve more and be able to do more specific tailored work according to populations. I always give an example. When I was doing a lot of health equity research in the city of Atlanta, it was predominantly black and brown communities. However, in recently relocating to the, Atlanta, um, to the Flagstaff, Arizona area, um, the predominant population is not necessarily African-American. There is a very large indigenous and Hispanic population here. And most people would think that, well, they're all minoritized populations. Can't we just treat them all the same? No, you can't. Because the level of marginalization, oppression, even lack of access that African-Americans are experiencing is going to look a lot different than some of the levels and barriers of changing that indigenous or native people are experiencing here in Arizona. And so I always like to challenge um, leaders, caregivers, uh, those who are in especially decision-making power um, positions in their institutions to not um, focus, on, like I said, so much on the one Band-Aid fits all, but to look at unique solutions um, and strategies and how to reach communities in the ways that they need best. And you can go to the next slide. I believe that's the next last slide. Um, and this is just some more um, how disability and racial equity kind of overlap, kind of overlap. <laughs> projects that I was involved in. I looked at some of the health in the state of Georgia. Oh, I'm so sorry, we're doing some feedback. Can everyone do? Can everyone do? Okay. Is everyone hearing feedback or is that just? I think we're good now. Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> this is just an example of a research project I was involved in the state of Georgia that looked at the utilization of telehealth among disabled people um, in rural Georgia. And what we saw, not only that were disabled people utilizing telehealth in the state of Georgia, but a, a great number of those people who were not only disabled were also from racial um, and ethnic backgrounds that were not a majority of the population, which was uh, white. Um, and so you can go to the next slide. Um, and so one of the things that I like to kind of throw in this presentation, because when we're applying uh, intersectional framework and we're thinking about community engagement and how to really get people what they need, um, I always like to kind of go by these kind of main six things that I think can really help and equip organizations 
to be able to better target BIPOC communities and applying that intersectional lens is, of course, we know nothing without us, nothing for us without us, um, including BIPOC people who also have lived in intersectional identities because they're going to be more likely to identify some of the margins that we can typically, over, typically overlook. Also, creating an advisory board that I think that is reflective. I always advocate for this. Creating boards to inform your research and recruitment ad strategies. You want your organization structure to be reflective of the communities that you serve. Um, relying on the experts, um, outsource the expertise within the community. I think this is what we're all here for. Um, myself and the other two panelists. Um, have a level of expertise that we can speak to and how we can either build in intersectionalities into our frameworks. Uh, hire disabled people. I don't think we can ever say that enough. Uh, we need disabled people in every every level of representation within an organization that also creates uh, intersectional pathways for disabled people to also cross over into professionalism, which I think is really important. Uh, do the work, get to know your community, don't assume things about the community if you haven't actually engaged and interacted with the community. Um, I know as a community-based research practitioner, there are some things that I have learned within the disability community that I have not have gotten um, from a book. And then second, and then the last point is, um, and this is not to go without saying, but disabled people don't need to be saved. We want to become uh, partners with your organization. We want to help create more intersectional pipelines so we can get more types of disabled people um, into your organizations and involved in the community so we can all mitigate um, different healthcare outcomes and research. Um, so that concludes my portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to answering any questions if there are, and I will pass it on to the next panelist, which I believe is Tamika. Hi, Tamika. Thank you. Are, do you want to share your own slides or do you want me to share your slides? Uh, you can share it. Great. Give me one second. I'm very excited to uh, present uh, today is I will be talking about uh, disability justice. So uh, Rashira did a great job uh, of, you know, highlighting, you know, the, uh, some of the aspects. So just another, uh, show you different, well, the principles, I'll be focusing on that as well. So Rashira did a great job. So, uh, like I said before, I'm going to talk about uh, disability justice. Uh, it was, you know, I use this term actually as my one of my titles, disability justice activist, and um, I very I do that intentionally because, you know, being uh, a black woman uh, with a uh, physical disability. Um, I think it's you know really um, important, and it really gave me a language that I use in in my activism work as well. So um, this is the reason why I you know use disability justice. And just uh, for quick for physical description, um, I am a brown skin African American woman uh, wearing long black hair. I am wearing a red uh, total, uh, total neck sweater, so, and my background is blurred. Next slide. Uh, so where did disability justice came from? It came from um, a term that was coined in 2005 by a collective of disabled women of other, which includes Patty Bird, Mia Mignus, the late Stacey Milburn. Uh, so disability justice examines uh, aspects such as, you know, the intersection of race, gender, class, sexuality play in the role of oppression of people with disabilities. 
And so um, in essence, we just go focus on uh, just the disability aspect, but all the identities uh, that a person has. Uh, so as it relates to the oppression. So that's really the basis of the idea. Next slide. Um, so, you know, so again, it includes, you know, just not on disability, but it also include the experiences of multi-marginalized people. So, you know, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA, homeless people, or, or, yeah, incarcerated people, and people who have had their ancestral land stolen. So, you know, we keep an account of like the indigenous community. So um, all those who live um, in uh, the margins, uh, we want to, uh, you know, include and um, advocate and to create change in our communities. Next slide. So disability justice has 10 principles um, and um, this was created by SINS Invalid. Um, and there's a picture um, on the presentation. There's uh, three black women, uh, one in a wheelchair, uh, one that's kind of like on her knees, taking a picture uh, with the other two women and another uh, black woman um, with the cane. Next slide. So um, just basically, I would give a simple uh, definition of these principles and what they mean. So um, intersectionality is, again, a term that was coined by uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. You know, so basically, as it's already been shared, it's um, how everyone has, people have different multiple identities and how that how those identities relate to oppression. And so, uh, for example, um, I can say for a fact, as a uh, Black woman with um, a disability, I, throughout my lifespan, um, I have experienced racism uh, just as itself. Um, I also experienced um, sexism and, you know, fight against the beauty standards and those type of things that the media betrays. Um, and so, and then of course, ableism as well. And, you know, throughout my life, and I think many people who have multiple or marginalized identities that you can um, experience those things and you really don't know which one uh, are people coming from um, when they say these to you or, you know, the the uh, microaggression that you may experience. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's one or if it's two or if it's all three. So uh, those uh, are an example of intersectionality. Um, then there's the leadership of those most impacted. So uh, that means that, uh, you know, that people that is closest to um, the problem should be part of people who's closest to the solution. That is uh, like a term that we use is social justice. And so, uh, you know, we're really big on, you know, placing those communities as most impacted in leadership positions and in partnerships with those who are serving them. up. So it's not like, you know, academia or, you know, uh, people who have no, relation uh, become the leaders all the time. But those who the most impacted should be part of that leadership. Um, and so there's also anti-capitalistic politics. Uh, so uh, basically it's saying that, you know, of course we live in a capitalistic society. And so, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. okay, my son. Um, so uh, you know, capitalism um is not always conducive to you know people uh, with disabilities because 
sometimes our labor uh, is based upon how much, you know, we can produce it. You know, our value is based upon how much we can produce. And so uh, it's just really pushing back on the idea that, uh, you know, we have value uh, just as being human beings. And, um, you know, and our value is not based upon how much we produce. And many times, as many of you know, that uh, disabled people, you know, are pushed into poverty. And so, um, you know, that, that reduces you know, um, a lot of things as well. So, you know, that's why we uh, that really push back on anti-capitalism or capitalism. Um, then there's cross-movement solidarity. Much of disability justice is hinged, um, on, hinged upon other uh, movements. So, you know, when you do disability justice, you also do racial justice. You also do, like, when it comes to gender and, you know, all those type of things. And so when we advocate, we're just not advocating uh, for, you know, uh, just people with disabilities, but for, uh, you know, when I advocate, I'm advocating for, you know, uh, the Black community and racial justice, also as a woman and those type of things. And so we really uh is big on cross movement solidarity um and liberation. Uh the next one is recognizing wholeness. Um that is another thing kind of similar to what I said before the anti capitalistic politics is that we recognize that you know as People of other with disabilities as just as people, we uh, are whole. We're not broken. Uh, you know, we're not, we don't need to be fixed. Uh, we recognize that just being a human being, we have value and we are whole. And so um, I really love, I love this because, uh, you know, many people uh, do feel uh, bad, you know, sometimes that they may not be able to do what they used to do or, you know, those type of things. And they feel like a less of a person. So I think once people, uh, you know, and particularly disabled people, we recognize our wholeness, um, it just, we, we move a little bit differently. Um, and then there is sustainability. Uh, that's another great principle. Well, I think that we, uh, definitely need to utilize more. And so uh, sustainability is that, you know, as disabled people, sometimes, you know, we need breaks and, you know, or those type of things. And, and, and we may not be able to move at a, a high pace as, you know, anyone else. Um, and so it's uh, really about, you know, doing the work, but then also preserving energy and, and taking breaks and doing self-care. And so, you know, we do what we need to do and put ourselves first, you know, before the work um, so that you can do it. Um, so we're, this is big on uh, being, you know, a sustainability. Um, then there is inter interdependence. Um, I know, uh, you know, we're so used to, you know, as societies, you know, it's like, oh, I need to be independent. I need to show that I can do everything myself. But, you know, it's okay to, you know, ask for help and need support and, you know, and those type of things. And so we really need to be, uh, you know, as a community, depend on each other and have that interdependence, um, you know, in our lives and being okay with, um, you know, asking for help and uh, support when, you know, when needed. So um, it's really big on um, interdependence. Um, and then you have a uh, commitment to cross-disability solidarity. Uh, this is a big one. Um, as well. Um, so, 
you know, as disabled people, you know, there's so many different types of, you know, disabilities that exist. And I know that, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially when it comes to funding, we kind of operate in silos uh, according to disability um, in the community. So it's just really this principle interrupt that and say that, you know, when you're advocating, you're advocating for, you know, people who, you know, who are deaf, or deaf people or blind people or, you know, say, so it's all different types of disabilities because we all, as disabled community, face similar things. And so uh, organizing, you know, across disability uh, is important and to uh, get rid of the hierarchy, you know, that exists and the side notes. Um, and then there's a collective access. So uh, that means that we want to make sure that everyone has what they need to access, you know, the meetings and access the space and, and allowing people to, you know, feel safe and being able to ask for those access needs. We want to make sure that no one is left behind. And so, um, you know, that is reported to, uh, you know, disability justice and disability justice communities to have, you know, make sure everyone have the access that they need and not to, uh, you know, shame them for that. Um, and then the last one is collective liberation. And so uh, collective liberation is like if, you know, what is not free, we are not free. Uh, just doing this work in community organizing, um, I find, you know, a lot of intersectionality, a lot of interconnectedness. So um, a lot of these are, each, like I said before, upon each other. And so uh, and that's why it's so important that, you know, to fight for, you know, not just your liberation or, you know, it's, it's for the collective because if it helps, you know, one person, it can help all people. So um, as far as, with, you know, liberating and those type of things. So uh, those are like the big, the breakdown of the, uh, 10 principles. I'll make sure to put up here the chat the juices in valid because uh, they're really great at, uh, you know, they, like I said, they wrote these uh, principles and it's a great resource to check out. So uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Tamija. Give me one second and I will pull up uh, Carol's slides. And yes, a couple of people have asked in the chat if we can share the slides and we will. Uh, I will be sure to send these out afterwards. Yes, we'll share that. And by the way, I'm sorry, I told her I wouldn't be able to stay, but I am staying for it. I just had a change of schedule. So if you have questions for me, you can ask. Thank you, Peter. And Leah, how are we doing on time? Uh, we are doing great. You still have your your time. While we're waiting for Leah to, to pull those slides up. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Carol Lapari, as Leah had said earlier and I serve as the Director of Equity and Strategy for a Center for Independent Living called Access Living in Chicago. Um, one of the, uh, the pieces I wanted to mention that we didn't talk about earlier was um, a little bit more about me. I also 
have a master's degree in diversity and equity in education, policy, organization, and leadership from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I also am currently pursuing a doctorate um, in organization leadership from Vanderbilt University. Um, so really, just as, as my other wonderful panelists said, um, also care deeply about intersectionality um, and, and have lived experience in intersectionality as well. Um, I am an Asian American woman. I have long black hair. Today, I'm wearing a brown and white shirt. My, my background is blurred, but I am in an office. Um, I also use a wheelchair. I'm a power wheelchair user full time and have used a wheelchair um, since I was about eight years old. So um, today I'm going to be chatting a little bit about what intersectionality looks like at a, at a center for independent living, um, specifically an urban one uh, being in Chicago. Um, so a little bit about Access Living. So Access Living is a disability service and advocacy organization based in Chicago. And since 1980, our organization has been challenging disability stereotypes, protecting civil rights, and championing, championing um, social reform to create an accessible and inclusive society for disabled people to live in self-directed lives of their choosing. Um, the uh, I want to read here as well our vision statement because I really think it captures so much of the importance of what we're talking about today. So our vision is that we envision a world free from barriers and discrimination, where disability is a respected and natural part of the human experience, and people with disabilities are included and valued. Um, being in Chicago and located in Chicago means that our consumer base, um, which is our client base, our consumer base is comprised of a range of consumers from different ethnic and, um, and, and just different backgrounds. Um, can you go to the second slide there, Leah? Or the last slide, rather? Um, so you'll see here that our consumer demographics, which is included in the 2023 um, annual report, which I'm happy to, to drop the link to, um, includes some important information about our demographics um, here in Chicago. So our consumer base, which is um, maybe, maybe unique um, uh, compared to more rural center for independent living, you can see here um, uh, can you zoom in just a little bit, Leah, so that we can see the, the numbers here? Um, what, what you'll notice... Um, Sorry, just I, I that, can't do that. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, and when you all have the, the slides, I encourage you to take a look to take a look at that. Um, what you'll notice in that first one is that it doesn't add up... Um, uh, fully, but you can see the different cognitive, hearing, mental, emotional, other physical, those different definitions of disability, as well as the race um, and age information. Um, I'm actually going to pull this up on our website so that you can see it a little more clearly. Um, since I already have it up here, I'm going to pull it up. Um, one of the uh, other important aspects of doing this work in an urban environment is, and something that's unique to Access Living, is our advocacy, outreach, and civil rights work. So the work that we're doing um, has touched on consulting and training, um, uh, the digital divide, which is launching a digital program to get laptops and digital education and internet activity um, connectivity to disabled people, um, diversion and reentry, economic empowerment, education, healthcare, housing, legal support, um, mental health and race, racial justice, justice, all of that work um, is going to touch upon the experiences of folks who fit into these demographics in Chicago. And so doing that work has been um, 
it's, it's really impactful. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Let me go back to the... Let's pull this up here. Okay, can you all see this? Sorry, I can't see. Can someone just come off mute and tell me whether or not you can? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, as you can see here, um, as we're looking at at this pie chart here, you can see that um, of our consumer dose, Black or African American consumer represents sixty one percent of our consumer dose. Um, uh, Hispanic and Latinx. 18% followed by white or Caucasian, which is 17.25%. Um, 17 and you'll see that um, in, in doing our, our demographics in this way, it's important that we are also representative of the demographic of people that we're serving. Leah, can you, um, I'm going to stop sharing. Can you go back to that first slide? Yes. Give me one second. So some of the, the work, uh, I'm sorry, the second one. Some of the work that we have been doing here at Access Living includes the race equity plan. And this race equity plan allows us to evaluate policies and procedures, um, programs and opportunities for inclusion and cultural shift. And that all of that work starts with an internal commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, again, reflective of the community that we have and the people that we're serving in Chicago. That, uh, some of the, the um, examples that folks have included um, should also look at diverse leadership. So when we're talking about seeing diversity in an organization, we don't want to see it just in entry level position. Um, we want to see it in leadership we want to see it at every level of leadership within the organization and have that commitment um, throughout our throughout our organization. Um, something else about uh, the cultural shift. So that could be including heritage months, employee resource groups, um, ways for encouraging inclusion, of course, with the knowledge that we also want to be hiring disabled people and should be hiring disabled people is that this is an important uh, moment and opportunity for us as an organization to talk about how does, how, what does it look like to have a, um, a, a heritage month that talks about the intersectionality of being an Asian American woman like myself and being disabled. What are some of the cultural implications that I am carrying with me about being Asian and disabled. Having those open conversations and having the ability to have that dialogue creates an environment where people can feel more included. Um, and that internal work is going to impact, again, the way that we're doing the external work. Um, I would also say it's crucial for organization to invest in roles that are focused on DEI. Um, of course, Diversity, inclusion, um, equity, all of these, all of these very important pieces of our work um, are a shared responsibility. And we all have that responsibility to show up to work with inclusion at the forefront. However, having roles that are focused in this work, so people, culture, equity managers, um, diversity managers, uh, folks who are focused on um, specific goals. So um, it, it, in, in our um, organization, we have someone who's focused on uh, Latin communities within advocacy. So having those specific roles and investing in those roles is an investment in diversity and inclusion. And so um, knowing that the intersectionality of that ethnic experience, as well as being disabled, reflected in, again, the role is going to allow us to keep having those dialogues. 
another way that um, some of my panelists have already talked about um, is forming committees and boards. So uh, when we're talking about what are ways that we can implement race equity plans? What are the ways that we can try to engage folks with Heritage Month and inclusion within the organization? Um, forming committees is a really great way to hear from everyone from every level of the organization, um, as well as allows folks to be involved in the decision-making processes. So those are, those are really practical ways to think about how we can implement diversity and inclusion in the organization. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Are there any, should we go into questions? Thank you so much, Carol. Yes, we can absolutely go into questions. Um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself or ask them in the chat um, and we will, kind of just popcorn it. I can maybe get us started. Um, hi everybody, I'm Dr. Kara Ayers. I'm the director of the National Center for Disability Equity and Intersectionality. Thank you so much to our panelists. That was fantastic. Um, I knew it would be, but you all just even surpassed those high expectations. So I learned a lot. And um, so a few different things are rising to me, but I'll just stick for one now because I know our, our group here is going to have um, a lot of other good questions. So I'm um, newly on, uh, newly president of our Ohio Silk Board. And when we think about the, um, or our Ohio Silk, you know, our council, when we think about the title of this webinar, what SILs need to know about intersectionality, I think one thing that strikes me is just how different all SILs are. And I only really, you know, know most about the SILs in our state, um, but even, even there, there's so much diversity. So um, I wondered if you could share kind of based on that title, what would you, based on, you know, also what you shared, what do you really think comes to mind in terms of what SILs need to know related to intersectionality to apply it to their work that they do every day, knowing that this is a really hard question because every SIL is different? Um, I guess I could go, you know, and unfortunately I have to I leave after this, this urgent matter, so I have to get to, so I'll put my email in the chat, but um, so to me, like, you know, when it comes to what, you know, students need to know about intersectionality, yes, oh, you know, there's like a big question. So it's kind of like, where, where did we start? Um, so I, I would say that um, just, you know, the same old people, and particularly here in Michigan, you know, they say that, uh, Statistics showed, the state of Michigan have showed that African Americans has the highest rate of, you know, disability. And there's the indigenous and Hispanic community. And that is, you know, in other, that's across the country as well, especially when you go into, you know, urban areas and even rural areas um, as well. And so I would say that, you know, I would like to see to make sure there is uh, intentional, uh, you know, work being done to bring those, to reach out to those communities, you know. Uh, so going to, you know, the urban areas, like there's, you know, Detroit, you know, it's Flint, there's so many, and there are sales in this area, but, you know, just make sure that you, you know, do the work to be in the communities, the communities of color and in, indigenous communities as such, because, uh, you know, we are out there and we're, you know, and we need to receive services as everyone else. So that's what I would, would say about uh, intersectional approach. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for being with us today. Uh, I would add on to what Tamika was saying, um, not only to know your communities well, but know where the paths of intersections are. 
because um, some of you may be in different communities which have maybe predominantly um, one homogenous group over the other. Um, but even in homogenous groups, there are intersections. And so like for me, for example, I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, which has a predominantly white culture with some indigenous cultures. Um, there are some pockets in my community that are primarily just more predominantly white um, and indigenous cultures are on more so on the outskirts. But even within the white culture, there are intersections within white culture, especially in relations of disability, that you can see the overlapping of intersecting identities. And so you have uh, gender disparities, um, you have uh, socioeconomic disparities that are um, laps of intersection. Um, and then even thinking about indigenous cultures, you know, indigenous culture is not a monolith that is very diverse within itself. There are multiple variants of different types of indigenous culture within the overarching indigenous culture. And so knowing which each tribe, um, working with each, and partnering with each tribe to see what their cultural preferences are, what their communications are. Um, and then even within specific disability spaces, there are intersections within disability. You have neurodevelopmental disability, you have physical disabilities, you have cognitive disabilities. And so I think the more specific that you get, um, I think it's just important for sales to really have a really um, strong understanding of the demographics of your community. And then once you get the overall understanding, then you can kind of dive more into the margins and into the intersections to make sure that even those who are most marginalized um, can all get access. That's great. I, I would also say that, you know, when we talk about intersectionality, I think it can be sometimes easy to see a person with intersecting identities and sort of tokenize them, right? Like it's sort of easy to be like, oh, this person checks many boxes and therefore I'm going to ask them all the questions. And I think it's really important that especially, um, it, and, and we see this in Chicago, that um, to not limit our frame of understanding of people's experiences based on those sort of demographics that are checked off. Um, sorry, I motion sensory lights. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that the way we do that is by inviting people into conversations. So as Bashir was saying, and Tamika was saying, be willing to have listening sessions, be willing to have focus groups to hear from your consumers about what are the needs of the community and also what are ways that we can invite them to be part of, um, part of the discussion when you're building out policies or building out um different strategies for your for your centers so i think that that piece of it of recognizing that just because people fit into these different categories doesn't mean that it's the same experience across the board and it also doesn't mean that we should be always looking for those intersecting identities to lead the charge on that change Those are all really great questions or answers. I'm sorry. Lori has um, another two questions. Um, first one on the pie charts, how do the demographics, disabilities, age overlap? And then our uh, second question is, how does intersectionality affect the unhoused? Yeah, so um, in that, in that um, visualization, we haven't broken it down in that in that way of looking at um, both the demographic and the disability and the age. Um, however, I think that it's a good idea and I think that it's something that organizations could certainly do um, to see the differences of what does it look like for a person who is older, who fits into this certain ethnicity, who um, you know has this disability. I think it's it would be really um, important information for us to look at and inform uh, decisions and and inform different uh, opportunities from that. I think too, um, gosh, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> intersectionality is always going to impact people who are unhoused. 
Um, in fact, uh, much of the work that we're doing in independent living here in Chicago um, is talking about uh, what that looks like. And I think it is important that, number one, I think we're, we're in a position of privilege that we have an advocacy department um, and that we can do some of that advocacy work to, uh, to, to address um, folks who are unhoused. Um, but I also think it's just part of the conversation and awareness that it occurs for, for disabled people of color at a higher rate than disabled white people. And so we have to be conscious about what that looks like um, and also develop then strategies. Um, looking at the disparities in the unhoused population, but I also would like to add on, I think um, sometimes that word unhoused can hold a lot of stigma um, in thinking that they are omitted from experiencing intersectionality. But if we go back to, in my slides where Dr. Crenshaw says, um, intersectionality is a prism into which we understand experiences. So everyone at any point will somehow overlap with the framework of intersectionality. Why? Because we don't live lives in compartmentalization or silo, we live intersecting lives. And this just does not apply to people of color or queer communities or women or uh, people of gender minorities, but intersectionality applies to everybody. Everyone has an intersecting identity. Um, you can be a cisgendered white male and still be intersectional. Why? Because you're not just a cisgendered white male, white male. You have may have a different socioeconomic upbringing. You might live um, in a different geographical location. Like your experience versus living on the West Coast versus the East Coast is completely different, and how those can overlap and also impact in how you receive support and services. And so. I think when we're looking at the unhoused population, I think it's important to note that intersectionality is important because it can also give us, um, it can give us context to how a person came to being unhoused um, and where are the barriers of access and where are there opportunities to increase inclusion and representation um, like Carol was saying. And so um, I think we just, uh, if I can encourage you just to keep that all in mind that in every demographic group, they I like to say that uh, disability is, um, it does not discriminate, it impacts everybody at um, any point in your life, you can become disabled. But I would like to flip that and also say that at all points of your life, you'll always be intersectional because we're human beings and we are multidimensional. We never live on um, one types of experiences. I have a question. Um, I think it's safe to say that everyone here probably helps facilitate different conversations, different groups um, in part of the disability community. Something that I've noticed lately, I think I think it's pretty well known that if we uh, have a group of, let's say, all women and uh, one white cis male, that um, to, to be stereotypical, that it's often that the white cis male will uh, you know, take over a conversation easily and that you have to navigate that as a facilitator. Um, but as a white disabled woman, I have recently noticed um, in conversations that white disabled women with other uh, women of color, white, or I'm sorry, of women, other disabled women of color will often kind of dominate that conversation as well. Um, and so I am just curious how we um, navigate some of those conversations in um, in these spaces and how do we facilitate this intersectionality yeah. like we can, I'm sorry, go ahead. We I think we lost you for a minute there, Leah. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, so you, you left where I heard you leave off was that you noticed that um, white 
disabled women um, kind of occupy or, or, or take the space or, or dialogue um, in a larger way than disabled women of color. Yeah, right. so if we have a space of disabled women of color and a white disabled woman, that oftentimes that uh, I see, I notice as a facilitator, an imbalance. So I'm just curious how, if we're facilitating, how can we uh, facilitate these um, values that we hold um, of intersectionality? And is there anything, I'm just thinking of SILs um, as they, as they do this work, um, it's one thing to have it in your mind um, and to know that this is something you want. It's another thing to live it out. Do you have, uh, can you give us some examples of how that would look? I know that's a vague question. I hope, I know you can do it. <laughs> I can go. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think it, it touches on this really important part of the work, which is what do I do when it's uncomfortable? <laughs> um, and I think that it's, that it's true. Um, one of the, the, the things I would say is first stop in those, in those situations, us as facilitators, I said, um, sort of leaders in that space have to be very cautious about the fact that, that there are intersecting identities and there are people in positions of privilege. And we have to allow for voices to be heard in an equal way. Part of that conversation comes with an understanding that the difference between, and this is something I say a lot to, to my staff and my, my um, peers, but there's a difference between productive discomfort and unproductive discomfort. And with productive discomfort, what we're doing is we're inviting people to like say, hey, let's let's check our bias, let's check our privilege, let's um, check these things that maybe we don't think about um, in a direct way and call it out and say what it is. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with with calling it out. If the purpose of the re like the purpose of doing it is to invite more inclusion and invite more spaces where more voices can be heard. Um, I think if we're if, uh, on the flip side, unproductive discomfort would look like we're trying to make a person feel bad or we're trying to shame somebody or you know, it, it, we're making people feel uncomfortable for no reason. I think the purpose has to be, let's talk about this, let's open up the floor and point out where the disparity is and go from there. Um, I think that it in we've done a really intentional way to sort of divert the conversation if we notice that one person is dominating the dialogue. I agree, Carol. I think, um, and I saw someone's comment in the chat, I think it is very mirroring to what happened in uh, the early women's rights feminist movements in which um, there had to be another second wave of feminism because they realized that uh, we were only showing white women's voices and not all the other women. And now um, I wouldn't say that the disability rights and justice movements have um, done that, but I will say um, we have to be careful. And I think this is where intentionality comes from, that when we are constructing our panels, when we are thinking about our staff, when we're thinking about recruit recruitment, looking at where representation, who is already at the table, and then looking at who is missing. And I think this is impor important to add balance to our structures and our organization. And then I, I'm I'm sure some of you are like, well, we know who is missing, but like we don't have connection with them or we can't contact them or, you know, there's not that same level of engagement. Um, and so I would just encourage you, um, I think it goes back to really uh, connecting and knowing your community and also being willing to 
uh, connect with communities outside of your level of comfort, kind of like what Kara was saying, and creating that space when there otherwise isn't space to cre be created. A, a small short story, I had a director one time who was asked to be on a panel um, and she was saying, you know, she was honored with the opportunity to be on the panel, but she also felt uncomfortable because she realized that she being a white woman, that the panel was completely full of white people. And she was saying, you know, if we're talking about these things related to equity and the whole panel is white, that doesn't that kind of contradict the purpose of the panel. And so I think it also takes the partnership of non-women of color who can also stand up and say and point out these areas of inequity or um, or silence saying that we need um, more women of color to speak. Um, and I think that that burden shouldn't just be placed on women of color to be able to say that, but also to our allies and our partners. And I think that also extends the invitation of creating, uh, like you said, care more spaces of inclusion um, where more people can be speaking out and not just a burden on the people who are missing. Kind of like what we say in disability spaces, like disabled people shouldn't be the only one advocating for disability rights, right? I think the same concept applies, like uh, non-women of color, or white women, what am I saying? Non-women of color shouldn't be the only women who are advocating for women, more women of color in this space. It should be all of us. And I think that's where we all can share the burden and make sure that the space is truly inclusive and reflective of everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I want to read a couple of things in the chat. I know that uh, Rashira uh, responded a little bit to this. This conversation reminds me of how women of color were marginalized and silenced during the women's suffrage movement. Um, are we seeing that same thing during the ongoing disability rights movement? As a Latina, I've seen pushback on my end. Uh, do either one of you want to add more to that? And then Vicky added, I just turned down the opportunity to speak for an important panel because of all the folk, all of the folks were white like me. Yeah. Any yeah, I mean, I think that that recognition of um, positionality is really crucial. And I think that is the type of energy we need if we're looking to transform our organization. Um, I think like for me, I when I when I think of intersectionality and and I think of like my personal experience with it, um, I you know I am a, a as I stated earlier an Asian American woman. I have a partner who is um who is white and he's a white cisgendered male, um, and he's tall and sort of uh, uh conventionally attractive, and so. He sort of checks all these boxes of the things that I'm not. Um, and, and what's so interesting is that anytime we're out in public, people will speak to him first and they'll ask him questions first. And they'll, you know, ask questions about me if we're ordering food, they ask him before me. Um, and what's so interesting about that is that there are times that I've experienced it when it's that people had this assumption that I would sitting down using a power wheelchair therefore the stereotype is that i'm not able to speak for myself or i don't have the ability to speak for myself but on the flip side there are people who think oh she's asian she can't speak english and so it's like you have these sort of intersecting stereotypes even that are like oh what it, it could be all of the above some of the above <laughs> you know and and the reaction is still the same the outcome is still the same that I'm not being spoken to my white partner is. And so I think it's important when we're when we're thinking about um, just the, the movement as a whole to recognize that stereotypes and stigmas are gonna play into the sort of trickle down one-on-one -on -one interaction that we have with people. And so our challenge as facilitators and leaders in this space is to recognize it and say, where, how is that going to play in? to this interaction? How is that going to play into this panel, into this discussion, you know, and, and being aggressive about the way we educate ourselves is super crucial. 
I think you hit it spot on, Carol, and and that reminded me of, um, you know, I went to a HBCU and for my master's, and I always, I came out of there not realizing that we think intersectionality is just, or diversity and equity is just for communities that are not of color. Um, but what I experienced is that not only do uh, predominantly white spaces need to be intersectional, but so do minoritized spaces need to be intersectional. And I find myself that um, when I am in predominantly Black spaces, I am the one advocating for disabled people. I am the one advocating for a more diversity because um, Black people are not a monolith. And so, yes, we are maybe have the diversity box checked off, but do we really if we're not fully inclusive and that was a very upward, hard battle that I still have to fight because we tend to think that minority communities are omitted from having to align to intersectional principles and they're not. Um, and so, like I said, when I'm in spaces, um, yes, I am a black disabled woman, but there needs to be more. I shouldn't be the only one. Um, and so I am advocating like not only you know, in black spaces and Hispanic spaces and Asian spaces, like it's great to have these intermingling of cultures present, but are we really going horizontally and vertically when we're thinking about intersectionality and making sure all boxes are checked off, kind of like you were saying, Carol, and then doing more of the work, you know, it, it makes no sense to have a panel if it's all women, you know, or if it's all people of the same gender, you know, you, you want to have that, um, variation and representation uh, that I think is really, really important. What an incredible conversation. Um, I'm gonna open it up one more last time for last uh, questions or thoughts. Um, but we also, I've just put it in the chat, we hope you will uh, follow our work. Uh, you can find more at thinkequitable.com and you can also follow us on social media at Think Equitable. So we hope that you will continue uh, following what we're doing. And um, again, thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you so much for the panelists um, for sharing your experience and expertise. Uh, we couldn't be more appreciative of you guys. All right, everyone, have a good day. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Take everyone. Care, everyone. This, this was really good. I think you all did a very good job, and I look forward to staying in touch with you. And please do share the recording, because I think you know, some of us couldn't attend, and plus there's a lot that we could do. Thank you, everybody. Great Bye. presentations. Bye. Bye. OK, well, thanks. Bye. Thank you, Peter. I guess I could have him. I'm good to go. Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome.